I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. And I must tell you, I spent a portion of this week coming back to Hebrews 11 to prepare us to step back into uh, the book that we began a year and a half ago, uh, the study of the book of Hebrews. And we are at Hebrews 11.23. Don't turn to it because... Um, Colossians has almost become a bit like flypaper in my hands to me. I can't quite let it go. And there are yet a few more treasures while we are in the neighborhood that I would like for us to drive by and see. And so uh, today I want us to look some together in Colossians chapter 2. And part of the difficulty of a pastor at times like this is knowing uh, the right message to bring to the congregation at the right time, but I feel very strongly about these verses being necessary in our diet as a church and that these will strengthen us. So I feel a sense of destiny about my life to be here today to bring these verses, and I trust you feel a sense of destiny about being here today and receiving these verses and for these to be incorporated into your spiritual life. I want to begin reading in verse 1, Colossians 2, and naive as I am, I actually thought that I could do the entire chapter today, and uh, I do know when you're laughing at me as well, and so I have suddenly been sobered to realize I cannot. So let me read uh, the first 10 verses and God would be good to allow me to complete this with you this day. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. And for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth, all the wealth, that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ Himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so, so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore... As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in Him you have been made complete. And he is head over all rule and authority. The message of the book of Colossians is one that is very much needed in this hour in the church. It is very simply this. The superiority and the all-sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians states unmistakably that Jesus Christ is God, fully God, in human flesh. He is the infinite, eternal God in a human body. Colossians 3.11 goes so as so far as to say that Christ is all and in all, meaning that Jesus Christ is all that God is. There is nothing lacking in Him of deity. And there is no shortage of deity in Him. Therefore, if you have Christ living inside of you, you have been made complete. You have everything that you need already deposited inside of you to live the Christian life in a way that God has called you to live it. You have all grace, all forgiveness, all wisdom, all knowledge, and it is all bound up in Christ whom you have received. 
You do not need a second blessing. You already have Christ. What more could you possibly need? You do not need a second work of grace. You already have Christ. You do not, do not need a mystical encounter or an emotional experience or a spiritual zap to help you in your Christian life. You already have Christ who is all and in all and you have been made complete in Him. What more could you possibly want than Christ? And this was the primary message of the Apostle Paul to the Colossian church the supremacy and the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Let me put it to you this way. All the fullness of deity is in Christ, and all the fullness of Christ is in you. Therefore, you are complete in Him. The Christian life is very simply receiving Christ at salvation and then walking in Him and following His Word the rest of your life. The false teachers had come into the church at Colossae and told them that they were not complete, that they were still yet lacking, that there was still something out there, some experience, some knowledge, some insight, some something that was out there that they needed in order to get to the next level spiritually. Now, these false teachers said, yes, you have Christ, but you need something else. Uh, you need the secret knowledge that we bring to you. You need the mystical experience, the angelic encounters, the dreams, the visions, the second blessing, the deeper knowledge, the additional philosophy. You need these other things to be supplemented and augmented to your life. And so Paul wrote to the church at Colossae to tell them they had Christ and they needed nothing else. They had Christ and Christ is everything. Nothing was lacking and is lacking in Christ. And you have Christ and His Word and His Spirit. Therefore, you are complete in Him. Therefore, you should spend the rest of your Christian life very simply seeking to know Christ more deeply. Seeking to follow Christ more closely. Seeking to love Christ more fully. Seeking to obey Christ more carefully. Seeking to serve Christ more faithfully. But Christ is the issue of the Christian life. As we look today in Colossians chapter 2, this is the distinct message. It is the sufficiency of Christ, the infinite resources and abundant fullness of Christ that is made available to every believer for Christ is already in us the hope of glory. As I look at chapter 2, and again, we will not do, be able to cover the entirety of chapter 2, but I want to begin looking at it today. I want to give you how this chapter lays out. First, the doctrine is in verses 1 through 5. The doctrine of the all-sufficiency of Christ. And then the duty in verses 6 and 7. As a result of the doctrine of the sufficiency of Christ, Therefore, what is our singular, exclusive duty in verses 6 and 7? And then finally, beginning in verse 8, the danger. Verses 8 through 23. And there are four muddy rivers of heresy that had converged together to form one polluted river known as the Colossian heresy. And all four of these dangers, these errors, these heresies had merged together and were being filtered through the church. And so Paul will deal with each one of these individually. And I don't know that there's anything that could be more up to date for us to consider. I'd like to point these out to you still by way of introduction. Let me show you what the four are. 
The first is in verse 8. It is humanism. It is philosophy. And when he says philosophy here, he is talking about human philosophy, which is nothing more, nothing less than secular humanism. It is, it is man's approach to answer the issues of life. And that was being merged into the church where it was Christ and philosophy. And Paul says, no. It is Christ alone. It is His Word, His truth, His wisdom, His knowledge. There will be no merging of philosophy into your thinking. And the second is found in verse 16. It is legalism. For the false teachers were putting the church back under the Old Testament law, the Old Testament ceremonial law, and were binding them to certain dietary restrictions, food and drink in verse 16, and to the observance of, of, of festivals throughout the week, as well as the new moon and the Sabbath day. And the Old Testament regulations, ceremonial regulations, were being added to their liberty in Christ. And then in verse 18, there is mysticism. Uh, mysticism which is... Uh, a supposed encounter of intuitive emotional experience with the spiritual world. And, and there was this, this merging of, of mysticism whereby they were claiming that they were seeing visions and they were hearing voices and, and there was the worship of angels. And Paul says, no, that is nothing more than your fleshly pride thinking you're some spiritual elite. You're not. And the mysticism must be, must be repudiated and kept out of the purity of the church and its teaching. And then there is a fourth uh, stream that was a part of the Colossian heresy, and it is found in verse 21. And it is asceticism which is a, a, an overt lifestyle of denial, whether it is living as a hermit or living as a monk or living as, uh, as whatever one who gives up certain things as if this is a passage now into the presence of God. And all four of these came together and were, were merged into this Colossian heresy. There, there is the humanism, the legalism, the mysticism, and the asceticism. And Paul addresses each one of these individually. And here is the burden of what he says. And this is the burden of what God has to say to us today. That there needs be nothing supplemented to the all-sufficiency of Christ. Jesus is all and in all. And if we have Christ and His Word and His Spirit, then we have all that we need to live a dynamic spiritual life. And we must never allow others to pull us in other directions. The philosophy and humanism... It will only corrupt the soul. And we must not be swayed and put back under the Jewish law and, and keep it in our own efforts. Christ is the fulfillment of the ceremonial law. And as well, the mysticism where there is supposed additional revelation that is coming to certain members in the body. Paul says, no, the truth of the apostles' teaching is all that you need to live your Christian life. Now is recorded for us in the closed canon of New Testament Scripture, and as well as the asceticism. Well, let's begin now in Colossians 2. And what I want you to see, beginning in verse 2, is first of all the doctrine. The doctrine of the sufficiency of... Of Christ. Paul begins this chapter by affirming the absolute full sufficiency of Christ in the life of the believer to bring him or her to spiritual maturity in 
Christ. So he begins in verse 1, he says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. And this struggle that Paul was engaged in, Paul is in Rome in prison. The Colossians are many miles away in the city of Colossae. And yet, nevertheless, there is a struggle going on in the heart and soul of Paul for them. And it is the struggle of a pastor's heart that they might be brought to full maturity in Christ. And the struggle is to engage in this spiritual warfare, to resist the false teaching that was spreading among them and that was stunting their spiritual growth. And Paul says, I can't just sit back and watch this happen. I cannot be passive. I can't even be in another part of the world and just let this go. I am engaged in this struggle for your spiritual good. And he adds in verse 1, And for those who are at Laodicea, that was 11 miles from Colossae, and the false teaching had already spread down the beaten path to Laodicea, and this was becoming a regional problem. And for all those who have not personally seen my face, and that is a catch-all to include others in that area. He says in verse 2 that their hearts may be encouraged. He said, this is my reason for writing, is that you would be strengthened in your spiritual walk, that you would be fortified and made strong in the faith and in the truth. And so I'm writing that you would be encouraged and built up, having been knit together in love. We are one in the body of Christ. Therefore, there is one body of truth. We have been merged together in love in Christ, and therefore there is one standard of theology and doctrine for the entirety of the body of Christ. And he says having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth. Now when Paul says that, he is playing off some of the vocabulary of the false teachers. And I turned on television last night and was listening to, to TBN just so I could catch some of the false teaching vocabulary. And it was amazing. In fact, I said, Andrew, this guy could sell ice cubes to Eskimos. This guy's smooth. This man is slick. He's extraordinary in what he is saying because there, there is, a, there is a, a desire on people to want to buy into what he was saying. And he was talking about just dream your dreams for God and, and dream your dreams big enough so God can fit into your dreams. And these false teachers were using words that people wanted to hear. You'll notice the word wealth, attaining to all the wealth. You tar start talking about wealth, just have a seminar on wealth, and people will come flocking from miles around. You tell them from the pulpit that they can have wealth, if they'll just do this and that and name it and claim it, you have a very marketable message. And so Paul takes some of the vocabulary that these false teachers were using, but he redefines the vocabulary. And he says, listen, let me talk to you about wealth. You already have all the wealth. You already have all the spiritual riches that you will ever need. There is nothing else to be added to your portfolio. There is nothing else to be added to your, your investments or what would come to you. When you were saved, you received all the wealth of heaven in the Lord Jesus Christ. God bankrupted heaven when He sent His Son to this world. And when you received Christ, you have received all the wealth there is to ever receive in Christ. And so, attaining to all the wealth, and when he says attaining to all the wealth, he is not saying there is more wealth for you to pick up along the way with a, a second blessing or a second work of grace, and you'll have a second installment of this wealth. Oh no. 
What he is saying is, my desire for you, and this is my struggle for you as a pastor, is that you would come to experience all that has already been deposited into your account. It has all already been transferred into your account. And when you received Christ, you received all the wealth of grace and wisdom and knowledge. You now need to get to know Christ. And you must follow Him daily. And as you do, there will be a growing and deepening experience of this wealth that has already been put into your account. And so he says, I want to encourage you that your hearts would be encouraged so that you could attain to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. Now, mystery was another one of their key buzzwords. And people always want to know about a mystery. A mystery is something that has not previously been made known. People always want to be on the inside, have insider information. It's like, can I tell you a mystery that no one else really knows about right now? And that's the way the false teachers were hooking the people to come into their camp and to come into, under their teaching. They had been taught about Christ. They had been taught about salvation. But the false teachers were saying, oh, is that all you have? Is that all you know? That's just so simple and basic. We would love to open up to you the mystery of the universe and open up to you the mystery of of life and those things that only a few of us actually know. And so Paul uses this very vocabulary and says, let me tell you about God's mystery. And that mystery very simply is one word. Look at it at the end of verse 2. Here's the only thing you need to know. Christ Himself. All you need to know is that all the fullness of deity dwelt in bodily form and Christ is in you. Look at chapter 1, verse 7. He says that God willed to make known what is the mystery of the glory of His mystery among the Gentiles. What is this mystery now made known? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the only mystery you need to know, is that you have received Christ, and Christ is in you, and all the wealth of His grace has been transferred to your account. And in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, all you need to know to do is to follow Christ, to learn of His Word, and to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we read in verse 3, in whom, referring to Christ, are hidden. Now, the false teachers used this word hidden to refer to the things that they knew that was the spiritual knowledge that was hidden in their secret experiences and in their intuitive insights as God, they claimed, was speaking to them. And last night they had had a dream and a vision and, and an angel had appeared to them and brought them some esoteric message. And they would make known what was hidden to the rest of the body of Christ they knew this mystery and would unveil it to them. And Paul says, no. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Meaning, as you have come to know Christ, you have come to know all true wisdom and knowledge. 
You have come to know God. You have come to know sin. You have come to know yourself. You have come to know heaven and hell and the Christian life. You have come to know all the truth that you need to know to implement in your Christian life because you have come to know Christ. Look at verse 3 again. How much wisdom and how much knowledge is in Christ? How much would there not be in Christ that would come from some other source or through some other means? He says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are contained in Christ. If you have received Christ, you have received the mind of Christ. If you have received Christ, you have received the Spirit of Christ and the Word of Christ. You need no other private, secret, elite information. In fact, he says in verse 4, I say this so that no one will delude you. You know what it is to delude. If you had a glass that was half full of Gatorade or Powerade and poured water in on top of that, you would dilute what potency there was. And if you kept drinking and kept adding simply water, it would be watered down, it would be diluted until it would finally reach a point where it was only all water. Paul says, don't let anyone delude you. I have brought you the truth about the Christian life. I have brought you the truth about Jesus Christ. And as these false teachers are coming and telling you about their their mystical encounters and these angelic rendezvous they're having and this mystical insight for everything they are telling you, they are diluting the content of the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. And oh, how good they are with powers of persuasion. Verse 5, for even though I am absent in body, that's because he is in jail in Rome. Nevertheless, I am with you in spirit. I cannot allow my mind to drift away from you. I am riveted. I am focused. I am bodily absent, but I am spiritually, mentally, emotionally present with you right there in the middle of this of your church. Rejoicing to see your good discipline, that you will discipline yourself and that you will resist these other avenues of supposed spiritual learning, you will discipline yourself to turn away your ear from them, for they are not a help, they are a hindrance to your spiritual life. I rejoice to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. The word stability here speaks, it's a military term used for a soldier who remains steadfast in an hour of conflict. And oh, they found themselves in this spiritual warfare. It was an invisible warfare for the souls of men and for the strength of the church. So this is the doctrine. All the wealth, all wisdom, all knowledge already in its fullness in Christ and in His Word, and you have received Christ. You don't need to be looking anyplace else. You don't need to be seeking anything else. You have already received it. Now you must spend the rest of your life diligently seeking out to understand the fullness that has already been deposited in your soul. Alexander McLaren, the great Scottish preacher of the 19th century, writes at this point, quote, In Christ, as in a great storehouse, lie all the riches of spiritual wisdom, 
the massive ingots of solid gold which have been coined into the creeds and doctrines are the wealth of the church, all which we can know concerning God and man, concerning sin and righteousness and duty, concerning another life, is in Him who is the home and deep mind where truth is stored the central fact of the universe and the perfect encyclopedia of all moral and spiritual truth is Christ, the incarnate Word, the Lamb slain, the ascended King, unquote. Well, if that is the doctrine, what is the duty? If all wealth, all wisdom, all knowledge is found in Christ and in His Word, then what is the duty that God has for you, how should we then live? Verses 6 and 7 provide the answer, and it very simply is this, which I've already stated, if Christ is everything, He is all and in all, then your Christian life should be exclusively focused upon following Him. So look at verse 6. Therefore, the word therefore as a result of the doctrine that was just previously taught in verses 1 through 5, the all-sufficiency of Christ. Therefore, as a result, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Stop right there. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, to receive Christ is to welcome Him into one's, heart, into one's life, into one's soul, into one's heart. We said in Colossians 1.27 that this mystery is Christ in you. And the conversion experience is a receiving of Christ into your life and into your very soul. And how did this occur? How did you receive Christ? You received Him by faith. Solus Christos from the Reformation, Christ alone. By faith in the all-sufficient Christ, you received Christ by looking to Him, by believing in Him, by trusting Him, by turning to Him. You didn't turn to some mystical experience in order to be converted. You didn't come to God through some angelic mediator. You didn't come to God through some hyped up emotional experience. You came to God with the full faculties of your mind in humility and repentance and saving faith. You came burning your bridges behind you to the world and you surrendered and you submitted your life to Christ Jesus the Lord. And when he said the Lord, he gathers up everything that he told us in chapter 1, that Christ is the image of the invisible God, firstborn among all creation, that by Him all things have been created in the heavens and the earth, that He is the head of the church, He is before all things. And when he says the Lord, he is pulling forward everything that He has taught us about the, the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Christ whom you received. Christ Jesus the Lord. And would you notice, they didn't receive merely the message. They received the man, Christ Jesus. They didn't receive merely the plan. They received the person of Christ by faith in Christ alone, by faith in Christ plus nothing. So therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. As you came to Christ, so continue in Christ. You came to Christ by hearing the objective revelation of the Word of God, the propositional truth, the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints, the standard of sound words. You heard the apostles' teaching and the written Word of God as it was beginning to be recorded. 
in New Testament Scripture. You did not come to Christ through some hyper-emotional experience. You came to Christ exclusively and solely by faith in the Word of God. So walk in Him. To walk refers to one's daily conduct. It, it refers to moving out, moving forward. It refers to purpose. It refers to direction. It refers to a process. It refers to effort and responsibility and staying on track. And throughout the New Testament, the Christian life is pictured as a walk. So walk in Him. What He is saying is the way that you were saved is the way that you are sanctified. The way that you came to Christ is the way that you will continue in Christ. When he says, so walk in Him, he's saying Christ is the sphere in which you are to live your Christian life. You are to walk in His Word. You are to walk in His Spirit. You are to walk in His power. You are to walk in His grace. You are to walk in His wisdom. You are to walk in His truth. You are to walk in His love. The entirety of your Christian life will be lived in Christ and do not ever take one step away from walking in Christ. This is exactly what Paul is saying. And now he reminds them in verse 7 the way this has been layered out for them. He says in verse 7, "...having been firmly rooted..." That speaks of the time of their conversion the moment of their salvation. It's perfect tense, meaning that they were in the past firmly rooted in Christ. They were planted in Christ, plugged into Christ, with continuing results into the present. This is how you were saved, he said. You were firmly rooted in Christ. You were like a plant that was, that was transplanted from the front yard to the backyard from darkness to light. You were planted into the world, in the world system, and at conversion, you became firmly rooted in different soil. You were planted in Christ. And I hear Psalm 1, verse 3, that talks about this, this righteous man like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. So that's what happened at your conversion. You were rooted in Christ. Planted in Christ. He adds to that, now being built up in Him. Changes verb tenses to the present. In the past, with continuing result, you were firmly rooted in Christ. And now today, presently, and every moment for the rest of your Christian life, you are to be built up in Him. You are to be edified in Him. You are to grow in Him. And established in your faith. That too is present tense. And this is the ongoing experience that they were to have. Just as you were instructed. You don't need any new teaching. You don't need any new strange doctrine. Listen, if it's new, it's not true. Just as you were instructed in the truth and overflowing with gratitude. This was their spiritual duty as charged by the Apostle Paul. They were to walk in Christ. They were to walk and live their Christian life in the sphere of Christ and the resources that have already been placed within them. They were to walk in Christ's wisdom, to walk in Christ's knowledge, and in Christ's spiritual wealth. This is the duty that God has for us. We are to walk in Him. Look for a moment in chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, to be raised up with Christ means to be regenerated, means to be raised from spiritual death unto newness of life, and if you have been raised up and seated with Christ in heavenly places. It's another way 
of saying, if you are saved, if you've been raised up with Christ, so what should be the focus of your life, of your spiritual life? It's very simple. It's not ten things. It's not fifteen things. It's just one thing. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated. In other words, keep seeking Christ and His kingdom of heaven. For He is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you are hidden and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your entire spiritual life is surrounded by Christ. You, you are enveloped in Christ, with Christ, in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is our life is revealed, referring to His second coming, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. But he says, verse 4, Christ who is our life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. It is all self-contained in Christ. And you have received Christ. You don't need to be looking for anything else to be added to the simplicity of your faith in Christ. This leads us to the danger in verse 8. And as Harry Ironside once said, wherever there's light, there's bugs. And wherever the light of God's holy truth shines forth, there will inevitably be drawn the bugs of bad teaching, which soon becomes the bugs of false teaching. And there is a slippery slope upon which one may put his foot that takes him down into heretical teaching. And so beginning in verse 8, Paul is a physician of the soul and a physician of the church. And he marks out these four cancers that are eating at the spiritual life of the church and threatening her potency and threatening her strength. Not that she would lose her salvation, for such is impossible, but is threatening to, to suck the life and the energy out of her and prevent her from being all that she could be in Christ. And so in verse 8, he mentions the first of these cancers that were malignant and were spreading within the body at Colossae. And the first is humanism in verse 8, or what Paul identifies as philosophy. And that's what philosophy is. It is nothing more, nothing less than secular humanism. And so we read in verse 8, see to it, this is your responsibility. You need to have your spiritual eyes open. You need to have your radar up. You need to see to this. Don't be naive. See to it that no one takes you captive. And the word captive here means to kidnap a child. It means to, to break into a house and plunder treasure. Don't let anyone break into your mind and in your thinking about Christ and the spiritual life because you would be very easily led astray. You could be easily found to be gullible. So see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy. Philosophy literally means the love of wisdom. Phileo, Sophia, philosophy, the love of wisdom. But it's not God's wisdom, it's man's wisdom. It's man's answers to man's problems. Philosophy refers to man's attempt to concoct his own way of looking at life. That's what philosophy is. It's man's own way of looking at life and trying to determine meaning and purpose and destiny. Human philosophy deals with these issues. Who am I? What am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? 
Where am I going? What's it all about? What is life really all about? That's what philosophy seeks to answer. And there is Christian philosophy, and there is secular philosophy. And Christian philosophy is a Christian worldview that gives God's answers to who am I and why am I here and what's it all about and where have I come from and where am I headed. Those are all legitimate questions. But unfortunately, there is also secular philosophy, which are man's theories about the universe and the world and life and purpose. And this is what the false teachers were adding to the pure teaching of Christ and His Word. There was a syncretism that was taking place. Syncretism means a merging together of, of two realms of, uh, of truth to, to, form one, to, to form one message. But this philosophy was more than a fly in the ointment. It was a deadly poison in the drink. They were injecting human philosophy to the teaching of Christ and thus it was becoming half a truth and half a lie, which is no truth and all lie. There are so many deadly philosophies in the world today and it's one bottle of poison and there are many different labels that can be put on one bottle of poison. There is secular, secularism itself, which says there is no eternal. You only go around once. You're only here now, so live for the now. Live for the moment. There is humanism, which places man at the center of the universe, and man is what it's all about. Now, there is pragmatism, which says whatever works is what is right, and something may work for you, and something may work for me, and I can't criticize what works for you, and you shouldn't criticize what works for me, and that's pragmatism. And then there's relativism, which is there is no standard of truth, and there are many standards of truth. In fact, there's situational ethics, and we can't make the call until we see what the situation is. And there is hedonism, which is what it's all about is pleasure, uh, to be happy, uh, to enjoy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, there's pluralism. Now, there's fatalism, which says that our lives are somehow controlled by something called fate or luck or chance or the stars, and people are into astrology. And, and, and there's pantheism, which is God is in everything, so therefore we must overtly guard the environment and there is sacramentalism, which is the priest has now become the mediator between God and man. There's rationalism and politicism and ecumenicalism and, and subject, sub, subjectivism and experientialism and enough isms that ought to be wasms. And the thing about it is, is that there's nothing new under the sun. And these have been around not merely for decades and not merely for centuries, but from, from the beginning of time. And they just become repackaged and recycled back through each generation. And they're all being pulled forward at the same time. And, and they are all seeking to put their nose under the door of the church and come creeping in and spreading into our thinking. And it, and it sounds so good. I heard a preacher not long ago not even open his Bible, and just have props while he spoke. And the message was the most awful thing I ever heard in my life. But you know what? It really sounded fairly innocent and fairly good. I had a man come up to me after it was over who was there I said, yeah, I've already heard that. We heard that down at our sales meeting down at his corporation. Nothing wrong with having a sales meeting down at the business. 
but it is the message of the world that seeks to encroach upon the truth of the church. And if Christ is sufficient, if the Scripture is sufficient, if the Spirit is sufficient, then outside information is unnecessary for the church to be the church. He goes on, verse 8, to tell us what it is. This philosophy. He, he, he plays hardball with us. He calls it empty deception. Empty meaning there's no reality in it. There is no truth in it. It is all smoke and mirrors. It's all sleight of hand. It's just a, a, a religious shell game. It's empty. There's nothing to it. And it's a deception. It's like a, a, a baited fish hook trying to lure people into the message and bite into it not knowing the fish hook of the devil's lie is there. And it all flows out of, he says, according to the tradition of men. The tradition of men is just simply old error that's passed down from one generation to the other, from one century to another. It has originated with man. It is passed down by man. It is received by man. It is propagated by man. And it continues to be passed down to the next generation. It was never true then. It is not true now. It will never be true then. It says, according to the elementary principles of the world, elementary principles literally is the idea of the ABCs. Things lined up, just very elementary. In other words, while it may sound so profound and just sound so deep, it really is nothing more than infantile speech. It is really nothing more than just kindergarten-level thinking. It is nothing more than nursery room-level reasoning. I mean, just take evolution. Please. You want me to believe that nothing times nobody equals everything? That's so stupid. That is so stupid. That is just elementary. That, that, is, that, that is just baby talk that makes no coherent sense whatsoever. And it's all according, it says, to the world. The elementary principles of the world. It's a bankrupt system in the world full of lies. And it's just repackaged the world's lies. And unfortunately, the church buys it. Again, I was watching television last night, and I would hate to mention any names because I would never throw a rock at someone that preaches in a glass house. <laughs> we got to dream big. We got to dream big. Big enough so that God can fit in. I mean, what, is, what does this even mean? What does this even say? What, what kind of double talk is this? Where, where is humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God and seeking His Word and prayer and seeking to do the will of God, being content with, with where I am, with what I have, he says, rather than according to Christ. And he sets the two in contradistinction. You can't have it both ways. You'll either have the wisdom of Christ or you'll have the wisdom of this world, which is philosophy. But those two orbits will never overlap. Look at verse 9 and we'll finish. Notice verse 9 begins with the word for which introduces an explanation, which 
introduces the reason why philosophy is so utterly bankrupt, why it has nothing to offer us, nothing to offer us, nothing to offer us, nothing to offer us but damnation. Now, you can go to a secular school and take a class in philosophy. In fact, I'd rather you do that than go to a bad Christian school, quite frankly. At least you know that's a lie. But if you're going to take a course in secular philosophy, you just need to know what it is, that you walked into a snake pit. And you need to handle the snakes very carefully. And here's why we don't need it. For in Him, meaning in Christ... All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, verse 10, and in Him you have been made complete. There is nothing lacking. There are no gaps. There are no holes in our soul. There, there, there are no gaps in our thinking that we need to have filled in by someone else. The Bible does not restrict us. The Bible gives us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I must be careful not to be deluded and deceived and plundered and kidnapped in my thinking and carried away because I have been made complete. In fact, in verse 10, it's very interesting. The word for complete is the same Greek word in verse 9 for fullness. Now, there's a play on words that's going on here. And when Paul says we have been made complete in Christ, he did not mean that, that they were elevated to the same stature as Christ, nor did he mean that any Christian became deity, but rather what he does mean is that our salvation and their salvation in Christ lacks nothing. It is a full salvation. Their understanding of Christ will grow. Their understanding of the truth in His Word will grow. Their application and appropriation of the truth will grow for the rest of their lives. But they will never color outside the box. They will never need anything that is outside the box to be brought inside the box of wisdom, of knowledge, or of truth, because all the treasures and all the vaults and all the storehouse of deity and wealth and wisdom and knowledge is found in Jesus Christ. And you have Christ. Could you want any more than Christ? And He is head over all rule and authority, meaning He is head over all the angelic beings. Why would you seek some angelic mediator or experience with an angel when you have the one who is the head over all? William Randolph Hearst once read of an extremely valuable piece of art which he decided must be added to his estate. When I was in college, my parents took me on a six-week vacation to the West Coast. And I remember one day we went to the vast Hearst estate. It took virtually the entire day to have a tour of this house and there, some of the greatest art pieces in the known world hung on his walls. It was a virtual museum. And Hearst read of a piece of art that was in Europe. He had many curators who oversaw his, his holdings. And he said, I must have that. So he commissioned one of his curators to fly and to travel to Europe to secure this piece of art. 
curator searched the great art galleries of Europe and the main cities of the continent in search of this one piece of art, and he could not find it. He wired Hearst back and said, I cannot find it. Hearst said, you will find it. I will pay any price to have it. I must have this piece of art. He could not find it. The curator returned, dejected, to California to Hearst to give the sad report. And before he went in to speak to William Randolph Hearst, this newspaper media mogul, he walked through the warehouse and there he found the painting. It was already his. He had already purchased it. I cannot help but hear that story and think of so many Christians who are always searching, looking for the new this, the trendy that. They want whatever is out there and to be added to what they already have. And the truth of the message is you already have all that you need. You don't need any more of God. God needs more of you. Did you get that? The thought that you would need more of God or more of the Holy Spirit or more of whatever is really a laughable thought as if you could even live up to one drop of God. No, the reality is you have all of Christ you will ever have the moment you are converted. And you will spend the rest of your life growing to know Him and walking in Him, and loving Him, and following Him. And it will be His Word and His Spirit that will take you by your left and your right hand and guide you on this walk. You have been made complete in Christ. If you're here today and don't have Christ, you can draw your own conclusions, then you have nothing. You are empty. You have mere existence. You are hollow. You have nothing, absolutely nothing of any eternal value. You have no meaning. You have no purpose. You have no direction. I was flipping through the channel last night and I heard that song, Dust in the Wind. We're just dust in the wind. Well, there's the world's philosophy for you. But you know what? Until you know Christ... You're nothing. You're just empty. You're just hanging out. You're just breathing air and taking up space. If you would come to know Him, you'd have everything. And He's offered to you freely in the invitation of the Gospel. But you must receive Him by faith you don't have to jump through hoops. There's really nothing that you have to go earn or do. You just simply have to finally come to the end of yourself. And you know what? Why would you hang on to your crummy little life anyway? That's all it is. It's a crummy little life. Why would you want to hang on to that and make that the center of your universe when you could live for Christ who is everything? And so I invite you to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, to look to Christ, to trust Christ, to believe upon Christ, who suffered and bled and died upon a cross for sinners. And in Christ and in Christ alone, you will find salvation and all of the spiritual riches of glory. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let us pray. Father, how we thank You for the enormity, the height, the depth, the breadth, and the length of the gift that You have given to us in Christ. Who of us here this morning even can fathom the unfathomable Christ? Who among us here today can even comprehend the incomparable Christ? all that has been entrusted to us in the person of Christ, creator of all, sustainer of all, 
fully God, head of church, Savior of His people, Lord over heaven and earth, that He would come to dwell in me, I must surely be made complete for Him to come and dwell in me. Father, I pray that You would enlighten us and open the eyes of our understanding that we might comprehend this indescribable gift in Christ. Bless Your saints here. Do not allow them to be deluded with persuasive argument. May they hold fast in the stability and good discipline of their faith and hold on to words of sound doctrine and not be led astray by those teachers who corrupt the teaching of Your Word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.